are all in all. Let us pray. Kind Father, we thank you. We praise you. We bless you, God, because when we look back over our lives, God, when we think about the fact of where you have brought us from, and when we stand here today, God, we know that it's only because of your mercy. It's only because of your grace. It's only because of your hand of protection that's been on us. It's only because you made ways in the wilderness that gave us rivers in the desert. It's only because you have been God in our lives and so God this morning we come not holding back anything but we come giving you everything we come lifting our voices and rejoicing to you God because you've been so good because you've been so great because you've been so awesome in our lives and God we say thank you now God we pray that you will have your way in this place move as you see fit from heart to heart and from breast to breast. Meet each and every person at their point of need. Oh God, speak a word to everyone while at the same time ministering to us individually. God, we say have your way in this place. Have your way in this place, oh God. We thank you, we praise you, we bless you. It's in the mighty, the majestic name of Jesus the Christ we pray and we give thanks and all God's children shout amen. Amen, and thank God.
Come on, put your hands together. You are Jehovah! 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. you can give. Certainly if you are in the tabernacle, we invite you to walk around at the appropriate time. For those of you worshiping on, online, you can drop your gifts off to 420 University Boulevard East, Silver Spring, Maryland, 20901, or you can certainly mail them into that address. You can use uh, your bank online through bill pay, and you can pay that way. You can also give through the Givelify app. Amen. Hallelujah. Let us recite our giving affirmation. Affirmation. I give because I love God. I give because I trust God. I give because I am obedient to the word, the will, and the work of God. Amen. Let us pray. Con Father, we thank you. We praise you. We bless you, God, for another opportunity to come into your house to give you glory, to give you praise, and to come bringing our tithes and our offerings to you, oh God. God, we know we could never beat your given no matter how hard we try, but God, we come in obedience to your word that, Lord, when we give, God, that you will give back to us, oh God. Lord, that you will open up the windows of heaven heaven and pour us out a blessing that we don't even have room to receive and that you will rebuke the devourer for our sake and so God we don't come giving grudgingly or because we are required to but we come Lord God with a spirit of joy and enthusiasm and expectation giving because we know Lord God you will give back to us Lord God God we thank you we praise you we bless you Lord God we thank you for the gift and for the giver for the tithe and for the tither, oh God. We pray, Lord God, that you will take these gifts, that you will multiply them so that we can continue to do the work of the ministry, God, so that we can continue, Lord God, to be effective beyond the four walls, oh God. And God, we say, have your way, Lord God, in this place. Continue to move in this worship service, Lord God. We bless and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray and we give thanks and all God's children shout amen. 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 If you are in the tabernacle, certainly we invite you to follow the directions of our ushers as we continue to worship God through our giving. As we give, we give God praise. Hallelujah. And we bless him. Hallelujah. The song says the greatest. The greatest of the Lord is inconceivable. The love that he showed. The love that he showed. Hallelujah. The power. The power of the Lord. Is unbeatable. Is unbeatable. As we say. Hallelujah. The sun says the greatness.
specializing in internal medicine in Silver Springs and Laurel, Maryland, where his main focus is on preventive care for men's health and wellness, obesity, and weight management. The management of diseases such as diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, and heart disease continue to be an important goal for Dr. Hill. He has become more informed about the many lifestyle habits that has a negative impact on our health. Sadly, many of our health challenges are the result of misinformation, lack of education, and aggressive marketing efforts targeted toward us. He is actively engaged in helping others in his community. In his community, activities such as mentoring, coaching, volunteering, serving on boards, and actively engaging fellow citizens is where he really gains joy and fulfills his purpose and makes the world a better place. He considers it an honor to be engaged in many activities as a life member of the Montgomery County chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. Now, Mount Jethro, please welcome Dr. Darrell A. Hill. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It is truly a pleasure to be here with you today. I want to thank you for this invitation. I especially want to thank you on such an important um, month, but we all know Black History Month is all year long. So I have 15 minutes to really try to leave you with some information that will help continue to help you stay healthy. Um, you know, I'm from New Jersey. I've always wanted to be a doctor. And as we go through the slides, I'm going to help you understand why this is important for me. So first slide, please. So if you look at this picture here, I think this is going to sum up everything we need to know about why health and staying healthy is important. You get to see different ages, different sexes, and all of them have different issues going on. When you look at a young boy, as much as education doesn't come into the conversation about health, how that young boy is being educated, where he lives, it's gonna tell you a lot. For our young men, less than 40, we cannot forget that the most common cause of death for us will be a violence at the hands of somebody else. So we cannot forget that. Of course, when you look at older men, all the concerns about prostate cancer, colon cancer, the stressors of life, blood pressure, mental health come into play. And of course, our young ladies, whether we're talking about uh, your mammogram, whether we're talking about pap smears, all that stuff is very important and we cannot forget that. So as we move into the next slide, what we're gonna notice too is, um, you know, I've been in Laurel for 20 years now and today, as much as we're talking only for 15 minutes, I'm bringing to you knowledge and conversations from looking in the eyes of people and educating them and learning from them and now today I want to hopefully bring that to you. And fortunately, I've been practicing in Silver Spring here for about four or five years now. And it's been great to come home. I've been a lifelong, well, I've been a resident here for the past 15 years. You know, my, my children grew up here in Montgomery County. So I consider myself a Montgomery County, Maryland person, just like you. Next slide, please. So today we're going to talk about some of the things that lead to our health issues, which sometimes we don't talk about, or at least today you'll get to hear just a different version of it. And then we're gonna talk about some of the chronic diseases that are um, something we all gotta deal with. And of course, ultimately all people, I say, whether you're from Maryland, East Coast, West Coast, Europe, Asia, all people want two things in life. We want longevity, and we want quality of life. Of note, when I started my practice, I did something that most doctors don't do. I, um, 
I actually had a physician home call service. So I used to do doctor visits in the home. I still do that. And I'll tell you, when you do that, you really get to understand why being a doctor is very important. Next slide, please. So all of us have a personal story, and my personal story is my mother. My mother um, had very high blood pressure from a very early age, and that's probably why my whole life I only wanted to do one thing, and that's become a doctor. Uh, I can remember at the age of 10, her having at least six or seven medications for her blood pressure. And as you can imagine, as I left high school, got to college, her kidneys were starting to break down. So ultimately she was on dialysis and she was on um, dialysis for the longest at one point than anybody else in the state of New Jersey. Ultimately she suffered a lot of the com complications, but when you look at her, her overall history, she's like a lot of us here. She was a hard working person. She had six children. She was growing up in, well, she was raising her kids in the hood and her priorities were her children. And back then, I don't know about you all, but on my stove in the kitchen, there was always a container of Crisco. And we did everything with Crisco. And y'all in here know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Next slide, please. So what we're seeing is lifestyles play a role. And next slide, please. We, we cannot forget to talk about the elephant in the room. No, we're not talking about the deltas. No, we're not talking about the deltas. <laughs> but next slide. The elephant in the room are a few things. Number one, we need more black doctors. And number two, there's something called social determinants of health. And when I was in medical school, we didn't talk about this stuff. I don't think we started talking about this stuff until maybe five years ago. But for those who don't know, social determinants of health are more important than the things that your body can set you up for when it comes to medical problems. We're talking about your job, your ability to have health insurance, the communities we live in, the educational system, and very importantly, we're talking about the policies that governments have in place that subject us to good things happening or bad things happening, and that's important. Next slide, please. So this being Black History Month, I want to take a quick second just to show you this here because we all should have learned this stuff in the second grade. And in my office, I had this hanging up too. And, and I was surprised. I had one person walk in my office and they knew who that man was in the middle on the bottom. Otherwise, no one knows these people. That's Onesimus. And he was a, a slave back in the 1730s. And he's the father of what we now know of immunizations and vaccines. And he was 10 years ago, he was recognized as one of the 10 most important people in Boston history. And many of us never heard of him. And, and the guy above him is James McCoon Smith. He was the first doctor, African-American doctor, to get a medical degree in this country. He had to leave this country and go outside the country, but he came back. And the point I'm making now is there's a rich history of what black doctors have done that we need to know about because right now, a big problem is only 5% of all doctors are African American. And it, and it makes a difference, it makes a difference. And if I had time, I'll tell you a few stories about that. Next slide, please. So this just gets into the social determinants of health once again, your neighborhood, where you come from, the healthcare system, education, and you know what's happening economically for you. I know when I grew up, I can think about my upbringing and quickly know how all these forces came into play and they're real. Next slide, please. One of the biggest things we cannot underestimate is nutrition. Uh, 
Over the last two years, I've had to dig deep at all this stuff because we never learned it, and if we did learn it, it's wrong. And you and I have to understand that. In my office, we have a display where we have about 10 or 15 products of food products, and we look at what's in those products. And when you do, you do it in a more calculated, objective way. You don't have to be perfect when it comes to your diet, but you've got to be good, and you've got to know what you're putting in your mouth. You know, I, I had a 30-year-old, and I share this story all the time, 30-year-old black male who literally turned into a diabetic because he was drinking two, two Gatorades a day. And for those of you who may not know, one Gatorade has 70% of your daily requirement of sugar in one bottle. So many of us, like him, we overdose on sugar and don't know it. And what's happening is, you know, it turns you into a diabetic. And if you're doing the right things, you'll see it turning you into a diabetic. So, so we've been lucky to educate people. We've been able to identify pre-diabetes, and we've been able to reverse it. And I'll tell you, even for me as a doctor, when you got to look in somebody's eyes and tell them we can really reverse your diabetes, that's a powerful thing powerful thing because we all know and we've all seen what diabetes can do to you. And I know as I say that word diabetes, for some of us, it brings chills into your back. I know it does. It's a scary thing. But just remember when you look at your food products, don't underestimate what's happening with the power of marketing. When you look at that Honey Nut Cheerios, for example, you're going to think that's a very healthy product. You're going to see words like natural you're going to see words like whole wheat. Make sure you're looking at the, the, the serving sizes. Make sure you understand that many of us, when we eat stuff, we're, we're eating way beyond the serving sizes. Uh, next slide, please. So just some quick tips. Pre-diabetes, we have over 100 million pre-diabetics in this country. We have about 32 to 33 million diabetics. Uh, the complications are real, um, so we got to be serious about that. What we're not talking about are things like fatty liver disease. When I bring this up, some people have never heard of that before, but we in the medical community, we know that we're dealing with an expected epidemic of fatty liver disease, which is a byproduct of all the sugar. The sugar, when it's metabolized, has to go somewhere, and it's being packed into the liver. And that's leading to cirrhosis, which will lead to a spike in liver transplants in the next decade if we don't get this under control. And that's reversible, by the way, as long as we eat right. And do not forget about apnea. It's real. If, if, if the snoring is there, there's effective testing. Um, and if, if people don't realize apnea is associated with a lot of other problems if you don't get it under control. And you know, it's possible apnea can be reversed by getting the weight down too. You know, BC is a real deal. Let's not forget about COVID-19. COVID-19 is it's with us. Follow the CDC recommendations and um, do what you need to do. Stress is real. Make sure we're exercising. And, and more and more, let's be careful about Dr. Google. You know, more and more, everybody, people are coming into the office and telling the doctors what I got from the internet. Um, just realize the most important thing is a partnership, partnership with your doctor. It goes both ways, but a lot of times I have to respectfully stop people coming into the office about what Dr. Google told them because you'll go down the wrong highway real fast, and you don't want that. Next slide, please. So breast cancer, got to get those mammograms. Don't be afraid. You should be doing your own self-breast examination. You know, I had a lady, very nice lady, who just did not want to do a mammogram. And, and you know, she got to be 80, and then she had a breast tumor just growing right through her breast. And get those mammograms. We don't hear too much about cervical cancer anymore. 
And the reason why we don't hear too much about it is because of a pap smear. So these screening tests do work. Colon cancer screening is real. It's rising in younger African Americans. We don't really know why. We all know about Black Panther. He was only about 39 years old, which is not supposed to happen. Uh, a lot of it may be related to our diets, but get a colonoscopy, follow the recommendations. If you don't want to do a colonoscopy, Cologar is really easy to do. You've probably seen the commercials. And for our men, prostate cancer. PSA is very, very important. I find that you've got to really have a good understanding of what it means when you order a PSA. PSAs can be very confusing because as you're getting older, PSAs get higher. PSAs also get higher because of cancer. So there's got to be a lot of understanding of what's happening as you get older, as you make decisions about the prostate. Routine checkups are important. Um, the name of the game these days is prevention. Prevention, prevention, prevention. Next slide, please. Fast food is real. It's all around us. It tastes good. I tell people fast food really has two goals when you come and get their food. They want you to like it, and they want you to come back. And when you, when you look at the nutritional content, and I have, you're going to see a lot of sugar in fast food, and you're going to see a heck of a lot of salt, too. So be real careful. You know, th this picture on the left, sitting down, eating dinner as a family, we cannot forget the value of that. Besides the nutritional piece, all the other benefits, we've got to make sure we maintain that. Next slide, please. Now, I know we're getting toward the end of my 15-minute talk, but I do want to share um, at least one of these situations with you because, you know, one of, one of these cases actually happened right here in Montgomery County, and, and um, it might have been my first ever patient to walk into the office. And I share this story all the time because it's hard to believe it really happened. But the reality is I had a 55-year-old PhD gentleman walk into the office, I tell people, and he was really just looking for a new doctor. He, he pretty much had gone to the doctor two or three times a year for the past 20 years, and he just happened to have gone to the eye doctor about a few weeks ago before he saw me for some vision problems. But it turns out when I put my stethoscope on his chest, I immediately heard something I had only heard in medical school some 30 years ago. Otherwise, you never heard this stuff. And, and it turns out that eye problem he had, that vision problem, he was getting strokes to his eye from his heart because he was born, born with a defect in his heart. And usually by the time you get to 50, the heart valve has to be replaced. But all the doctors he had seen previously, no one had told them about this. And he, I had to refer him immediately to a cardiologist, and the cardiologist had to refer him to, to a surgeon to replace his heart valve because nobody told him. And, and we looked at each other, and we knew what had happened, but it was kind of hard to prove it. I, I hope he's not in here, by the way. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But the point is, you know, we just got to be really serious about our health because we really may not get a chance tomorrow to, to be here because of something we didn't do yesterday. And one last case I'll mention, I had a new patient walk into the office um, just two weeks ago, and I went to go check his blood pressure, and he told me, no, 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 you don't have to check my blood pressure. I can tell you what it's going to be. It's going to be 252 over 125. That's what he told me. And I went to check it, and he was right. <laughs> but, but it turns out he had a lot going on, and he, he knew he needed help. But these are the kind of stories. So when you hear these stories about people dropping dead and people this and people that at young ages, it's real. It's real. And we got to do much better. Next slide, please. So I think we're towards the end. That might have been my last slide. And I want to say that um, you know, we know a lot about Dr. King and what he did with civil rights. But 
We cannot forget one of his most famous quotes, at least it has been for me the past five years or so. And what he said was, the two most greatest things in this world are what? Do you remember what it was? It was conscientious stupidity and sincere ignorance. And it's very applicable when you look at our health. A lot of the things we know what we need to do, but the question is, are we doing it? So thank you very much. Madam Treasurer, let's thank God for Dr. Hill again. How on this, as he shared, I agree how on this, what has been deemed Black History Month, uh, but Black History Month for all of us is every month uh, has come to share with us about our health and each Sunday we will hear from different medical personnel uh, so that we are strengthening our community. Some people may say, hey, we could do this virtually on a Wednesday, we can set up, and I thought about that. However, I think it is more impactful when it's live and in living color. And even while Dr. Hill was talking, there are uh, some key things that stuck out for me that I, as your pastor, even need to change. Because if we're going to be kingdom agents, then our temples have to be in check so that we can do what's necessary uh, to run this race that so has been easily beset us. Amen? Amen. Amen. So can we thank God for him again? <laughs> and just so y'all know, our choir's going to bless us, and I am going to preach. Amen? <laughs> All right. Come on, choir.
you, Jesus. chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, commencing at verse number 46, Mark chapter 10, commencing at verse number 46, here's how the word of God reads, then they reached Jericho and Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus was sitting beside the road. Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby. He began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him, but he shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. 
When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man, said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go, for your faith has healed you. Instantly, the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. I want to commence a new preaching series on this Sunday entitled, Experiencing Christ. And from that, I want to talk with this sermonic thrust in our minds, when you really want to see him. When you really want to see him. When this episode begins, Jesus is back in Jericho, the place where he had been performing miracles. He is on his exit out of Jericho, heading towards Jerusalem and encounters this community misfit, if you will. There is something major here because somehow this brother missed Jesus coming into the city. But he catches Jesus as he comes out of the city. Now my question is, why didn't he catch him the first time Jesus was there at the entrance of Jericho? Maybe, I surmise, he had not arrived at his post when Jesus was going in. Because in biblical antiquity, those who were beggars begged from the same location. They were not like beggars of today who would beg on University Boulevard East today and then be at University Boulevard West on tomorrow. They had their regular begging station. Maybe he had not arrived at his post when Jesus was going in because scholars suggest that this was his regular begging station. And maybe he was there but distracted by asking for alms money or receiving money, alms, from somebody. Maybe going in, he didn't pay attention to Jesus, but by the time Jesus had done some miracles in Jericho, people were so excited about his presence that they began shouting, which caused him to shout that his name on the way out. The news rumors of who he was had already spread throughout the community and no doubt Bartimaeus had heard the news and was bent on doing, here it is, what he needed to do in order to have an encounter with Jesus for himself. We're not certain what happened when Jesus went in and all this story shares is Jesus is on his way out and Bartimaeus begins shouting for Jesus. Read the text. It does not say that he asked anyone what was going on. It does not say that he started inquiring. He was doing his thing and minding his business. And because Jesus was in the vicinity of the people, he was in the vicinity of the people who were calling on the name of Jesus. He did what was necessary because he really wanted to see him. What we see here is an example of a man who is desperate for a transformative and life-changing encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. That he doesn't ask people to do for him that which he could do for himself. Because when you really want to see him, you'll do what is necessary to get into his presence. I believe Bartimaeus is teaching us some applicable truths about what is needful in order to have a personal and life-changing encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. This story unfolds. We can immediately conclude that apparently Bartimaeus had heard about Jesus. Jesus is en route. And as always, multitude of folk follow him, but not, but out of all who are surrounding Jesus. It is Bartimaeus who cries and calls out from the side of the highway. He is sitting on the side of the highway and begins his plea. The Bible gives us a hint that Bartimaeus likely had heard about Jesus before. Listen 
to the definite and distinct label he ascribes unto the Lord. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Where in the world did that come from? Maybe he was taught in Sabbath school who Jesus was. Or maybe, just maybe, he could have known a blind person who shared what Jesus had done for them. I mean, after all, Jesus did many miracles. But while Jesus is moving, passing by Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus petitions God from sitting in his normal spot. And he started yelling, Jesus, thou son of David. Don't miss this, because when you want to see him and desperate and need God for yourself, you can't call him based on what everybody else calls him. You have to call him for yourself. Clearly, this blind man on the margins of society had come to a faith posture that led him to conclude that Jesus was indeed the anointed one from the lineage of David and that he had the capacity to do for him what no other person in community, nor preacher, nor deacon could do. It, it all boils down to the matter of knowing who Jesus is and knowing what Jesus can do. Because when you actually know who Jesus is, and know what Jesus can do. You have no issue with calling on Jesus because you recognize that I know who he is and I know what he can do. I know he is a provider, but I know he's also Jehovah Jireh. I, I know he's God Almighty, but I also know he's El Shaddai. I know he's a bridge over troubled water, and I know he'll keep me when I find myself in deep water. Do I have any company in the building who can go on and testify? I know who Jesus is, and I know what Jesus can do. I know he can keep me, but I also know he walks with me. I know he watches over me, but I know he also comforts me. And I need about five of y'all in here who can go on and just testify. I'm grateful for who Jesus is, and I'm thankful for what he can do. I want to tell your neighbor, I don't know what you need from him. But your need is not my need. And my need isn't your need. But the good news is, I know who he is, and I know what he can do. So I'll surmise it like the saints of old. Jesus is on the main line. Call him up and tell him what you, what you, what you, what you, what, what you, what you want. He, he, he heard about Jesus, but, but notice I'm moving. It seems to me that he also found, here it is, a way before Jesus. Text says Bartimaeus is screaming, shouting, pleading, and the text says Jesus stood still. In verse 58, the people tell Bartimaeus to be quiet. I'm in the book, verse 48. The people try to block Bartimaeus' blessing. However, in verse 49, Jesus tells the people to tell him come here. If I had time, I would suggest that it's amazing how Jesus will use the very folk trying to block you as the same people that have to come get you. I, I got, I, that's, that's another sermon. Jesus, Jesus in the story tells the people, go get him. Jesus is really saying, instead of telling him to be quiet, go get him and get him to me. Bible says they go to him. And they say, blind Bartimaeus, be of comfort. You don't have to cry like this no more. This is your day. Jesus wants to see you. I'm going to get happy all by myself. Because I believe that what caused Jesus to pause is not Bartimaeus' condition. It was his conversation. <laughs> Bartimaeus wasn't just yelling. There was some specificity behind what he yelled. He said, 
son of David. He realized he was a sinner. He, 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 he says, son of David, he realized he's a sinner. Y'all saying, Pastor, where, where you get that from? I'm in the book. Because he didn't just say son of David. He concluded by saying, have mercy on me. It, it, it was interesting to me that Jesus actually interrupts his caravan and stops his travel and purposely engages Bartimaeus. I couldn't figure out why Jesus stopped for Bartimaeus. In fact, he really actually sent for him and told his disciples to bring him to him. Here's a man who is blind and historically identified as a beggar. Jesus comes along and the man doesn't stop begging, but he does change the commodity for which he's begging for. As Jesus is entering to the city, Bartimaeus is begging for money. But when Jesus returns to leave, he's begging for mercy. Verse 47 uses the words he began, which is a safe to say everybody was shouting. But he stopped shouting for money and began shouting for mercy. He found his way to Jesus because he recognized that somewhere along the journey he messed up. And the only thing that could get him right was mercy from the master. That's right. That's right. Mercy is admitting God, I've messed up and missed the mark. Mercy is saying, God, I didn't dot every I and cross every T. Mercy is saying, God, I need another chance because mercy is God holding back from you that which you really deserve and I don't know who I'm talking to but you ought to just look down your row and say neighbor I don't know if you dotted every I and crossed every T but I sure have it and I want you to know that I'm a mercy case that God has granted me mercy he's forgiven me he loves me in fact we're going to the table because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting I gotta get out of here he asked for mercy you ought to just take a few seconds and just thank God for mercy mercy met your case in fact, the writer says, morning by morning, new mercies I see. Which means yesterday's mer mercies are gone. And when your eyes unlock from the sockets of your head this morning, God gave you mercy. I got to go. Look what happens after he heard about Jesus and found his way to Jesus. Here it is. I'm done. He, he experienced the transformative power or the transformational power of Jesus the Bible says they come and tell him that Jesus is calling for him and all Jesus did was told them to call him and they did when they told him that Jesus was calling he got up and came directly to where Jesus was question how in the world was he able to get to where Jesus was if he could not see. It, it, it's safe to conjecture that it's likely those inviting him also helped to ensure he made it safely and clearly. Woo, preach boy. It's a picture of the responsibility of the church. We just can't call them. We can't just invite them. But we've got to lead them into a personal encounter with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's been ostracized, but Jesus is about to vindicate him. He comes to Jesus. He casts off his garments. And he took off the vestiges of his old life. And he took off the shame and guilt. Took off the pity. And cast away his garments in verse 50 and verse 51. There's a clear question as Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Well, if you ever ne never notice, if you, if you notice Jesus never addresses this brother sitting down. Jesus sent other folk to get him. It appears Jesus not only wanted to change his situation, but he also needed to change his location and direction. What is it that you want me to do? I have one request, he said, I want to see. Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. And the text says this one word, Instantly. 
almost shot it right there. It says, instantly. I'm trying to tell somebody. I don't know how long you've been trying to see him. I don't know the conditions surrounding your blindness. But when God gets ready to answer you and give you what you need and ask for, he can do it immediately. He can bless you immediately. He can give you joy instantly. He can grant you peace immediately. He can forgive you instantly. This brother reveals the transformational power of Christ. Jesus heals him. Here it is and I'm done. He follows Jesus. Because when you have experienced Christ for yourself, you have no choice but to adorn yourself in the team's gear and follow Christ. I like how the songwriter Simeon Mark Marock wrote it when he says, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world before me, the, cro the world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. No turning back. Do I have any company in the building who can go on and testify? Pastor, you all in my Kool-Aid with the right flavor. Because that's what I came on this morning. Because I've decided to follow Jesus. You can have this whole world. Just give me Jesus. I said you can have this whole world. Just give me Jesus. You can have this whole world. Just give me Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Well, the question is, well, why would I follow him? Because I know what he's done in my life. Because when I was sick, he healed my body. When I was broke, he supplied my needs. When I was lonely, he was my company. When I needed a doctor, he was a great physician. And is there anybody here? Oh, Matt, why you push me here? I said, is there anybody here who can say I showed up this morning because I've decided to follow Jesus? I don't care what you do, but I can tell you I'm going to follow him because when you follow him, surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life when you follow him he'll supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory when you follow him he'll keep your mind in perfect peace when you follow him he'll give you joy in sorrow and hope for tomorrow when you follow him he'll be there for you when everybody else walks out on you when you follow him he'll use your enemies as your footstools have I got a witness is there anybody I said is there anybody is there anybody here who's tried my Jesus is there anybody here who loves the Lord? Would you lift your hands, throw your head back, and with your chocolate voice, shout it, yeah! 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 Touch somebody around you say, I'm a follow him, I'm a follow him, I'm a follow him, I'm a follow him, I'm a follow him. You may not follow him, but I'm a, I'm a follow him. When you really want to see him, it's because you heard about him. You found a way to him. 
you receive the transformational power from him. I don't know who I'm talking to. We're standing all over the sanctuary. I want to offer this invitation to you. Because there's still some who live in spiritual blindness. I want God to open your eyes. I want him to come into your life so that you can see clearly. So if you're here, my brother, my sister, I want you to take serious this invitation to come to know Jesus Christ for yourself. If you're watching in the virtual sanctuary, the social sanctuary, there's a link that just went up for a connection card, commitment card, a discipleship card. Fill that out. Tell Jesus you want mercy. You need another chance. And let him take control over your life. So if that's you, my brother, my sister. Fill that out. If you're in the sanctuary, all you got to do is tell your neighbor, excuse me, I got to get to the front. Because I want to join Christ. I want to be a part of this family of faith. So if that's you, I, I want to be your pastor. We want to be your brothers and sisters in the faith. We want to help you to mature in this thing called life and Christendom. We want to show you who Christ is. So if that's you, my brother, my sister, come on. Give your heart to God, your hand to this pastor. I'm ready to embrace you. We're ready to celebrate with you what Christ does in your life. So if you're here, my brother, come on. Today, just come. Come on, let's say that again. There's nothing better. Than knowing Jesus. He gets sweeter as the days go by. Goes by. You are to know him. Get to know him. Get to know him. Right now, he's available. Come on, come on, say come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. Today is the day, today is the day right now. Today, just come. Tell them, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. We're waiting on you, we're waiting on you, we're waiting on you. Come on, Jesus can change your life. He can turn your life around. Right now, today, just. You may be seated in the presence of our God. Before we transition into this communion experience, let's hear from our morning announcements. Reimagine. 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 Disciples of Mount Jezra, we have opened to the next stage, Mass Optional. We will lovingly respect each other, whether with Mass or without. Join us every Wednesday for Refuel at noon for a time of prayer. See the Refuel schedule on our church website. Ladies, don't forget to come to the Fellowship Hall for Lady P's Tea. Today, pick up your tea after the 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. services. The tea of the month is Forever Nuts. Divorce Care Ministry Meeting will resume Monday, February the 6th through Monday, 
May the 1st from 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. For more information, please contact Reverend LaWanda Sadler. Rachel Circle will hold its ministry orientation on February the 8th at 7.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Please check your email for our weekly announcements, which will encompass the Zoom information or see Reverend Kristen Elliott. On February the 11th at 10.30 a.m., Social Action Ministry will convene its February meeting. The purpose of Social Action Ministry is to provide social and political information that is relevant. Please see Sister Bernice Miller or check the MJBC Messenger for more details. On February the 11th at 5 p.m., please join the Women's Ministry for a foot washing ceremony. For more details, contact Sister Loveness Overton, Sister Gina Stevenson, and Sister Mallory Giles. Celebrate Super Sunday on February the 12th, which includes the First Quarter Fellowship, recognizing new members, quarterly birthdays, anniversaries, and the Super Bowl. Disciples are asked to wear their favorite NFL jersey for the celebration. Calling all men of Mount Jesuit. Join the men's ministry on February the 18th at 9 a.m. for a day of painting. Yes, we will be giving Tamara Fellowship Hall an aesthetic update. This is a time that we will beautify the Lord's house. Looking forward to seeing you. For more information, please contact Deacon Tyrone Willis or Brother Carl Overton. If you have a gift for decorating, there are seasons where we will decorate the Lord's house. Please see Lady P and sign up to play your part in our church decorating team. It is not too late to turn in your pledge card for I Love My Church Stewardship Campaign. This is going to be an amazing three-year journey and you don't want to be left out. Save the date, February the 19th, as we celebrate our pastor's birthday. Our guest proclaimer will be Reverend Clinton D. Wallace, Nazareth Baptist Church, Rosenberg, Texas, and Enterprise Baptist Church, Bay City, Texas. The Women's Ministry presents My Well-Being Matters series. Come and experience a journey into wholeness. Hear from author, mental health consultant, Candace Washington, and board-certified nurse practitioner, Isoki Baptiste. You don't want to miss this phenomenal series. Throughout the week, we want you to stay connected with us by subscribing to our YouTube channel as well as Facebook and Instagram. May we all reimagine ministry work and the work of ministry. Until next time, have an amazing week. One other announcement I would love for our disciples to flood our church's website, click the Christian Education tab and register for our Koinonia Bible Institute that begins on February 21st. Because all of us want a transformational encounter with God, right? So let's make sure that we flood the website to register, check the email, register. Make sure you register for each or one of the classes that is being offered commencing February 21st. To our online worshipers, we hope you have your elements uh, as we go to the Lord's table. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this moment that we remember what you have done for us. We ask your blessings upon the bread that represents your body and the cup that represents your shed blood for remission of sin. We thank you, God, for going on Calvary's mountain in our stead. And we give your name praise for saving us. Bless this time now. In Jesus' name, amen. On the night when he was betrayed, after giving thanks, he took the bread and broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And they ate together. 
Likewise, he took the cup and said, this is the new covenant. I will not drink with you until you come into my father's house. This is a drink offering that is poured out for the remission of sin. The hymn writer put it this way, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It says, as often as you can do this in remembrance of me, and they drink together. Following that moment in the upper room, the Lord's Supper, he commissioned them to go out and share the gospel with Jesus Christ, to tell someone about who Christ is. In Mount Jezreel, as we experience Christ, these are in packets of five. And following the benediction, as we are exiting, I'm going to ask if the ushers can give every, every adult a packet of five. This is a join us. Evangelism doesn't start at the invitation of the sermon. It starts at the exit to witness. So when we leave from this place, we should be leaving going to tell someone about Christ and even share with them your church. I've heard some persons who have said, you know, I don't invite persons here for this and that reason. But God has called us to invite people to a loving relationship with him. So I want you to take these cards, have the deacons, if they can take this basket to the ushers. Take that card, and I want you to begin on this week. Pray tonight on the five people you're going to witness to. Three who you know personally, but two who you see as you're moving around through your day, whether it be at work or in the store. Just invite somebody. For those who say, well, I really don't know how to talk to them, just say, hey, here's a card. If you have time, swing past our church. Come experience Christ with me. I'll be looking for you. Can we do that? All right. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Shall we stand? Father, we thank you for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard. We thank you for Dr. Hill, who's cleared his schedule to enlighten us to live long lives. Because God, your word even declares that life is forced three score years and ten, but if by reason they be four score years. So God, we need to do our part. Human responsibility coupled with divine sovereignty. We praise your name, God, that we desire to see you clearly. We want to encounter you in a transformational way that we go and tell others who it is we follow. Now unto him who's able to keep us from falling, able to present us spotless before his immaculate throne, to the all-wise God our Savior, to him be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, now, henceforth, and forevermore, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And everybody who loves the Lord, shout it, amen. amen. God bless you. Know that I love you, Mount Jezreel, and there's nothing you can do about it.